、uh, today's speaker, okay,、uh, Hiroshi Oguri、uh, from Caltech and also the director of the Kavli IPMU. And uh, so uh, he will talk on、uh, symmetry in QFT and gravity. Okay, so can you share the screen now? Sure.、Uh, oops, I closed it, so let me open it again. I'm sorry. Let me. Oh, okay, so let me do this arrangement again. Okay, yes, I think. Okay, yes.、Uh, can you see this? Yes. Good.、Yeah. Oh, okay, do you want me to start? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay, <laughs> so uh, 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 good morning, good afternoon, good evening.、Uh, thank you very much、uh, for this opportunity to uh, present uh, this talk uh, entitled The Symmetry in Quantum Field Theory and Gravity. And I'm particularly delighted to give this talk to this group of people、uh, working on local quantum physics because uh, uh, for the last few years、uh, I had the opportunity to learn some. Aspect of、uh, algebraic approach to quantum field theories because、uh, they play,、uh, the techniques、uh, developed in that area have played a very important role in what I'm going to talk about today. So, so I will describe some of that and then I、uh, would also need to introduce some concept, but I'm a little bit、uh, sort of uh, uh, in a, I, I feel as if I'm like a student.、Uh, Uh, giving presentation to my professors because、uh, I think some of those things、uh, that you have developed. And uh, uh, so, so be because of that, uh, uh, please, uh, uh, during my talk, please do not hesitate to、uh, unmute yourself and ask a question or make any comment because、uh, that e d u c a t e me and that helped me also to adjust my talk to the audience. So, let me start with a, a, a sm small motivation、uh, to this talk. So, so, I've been interested in understanding、uh, quantum gravity, various aspects of quantum gravity, and in particular, what it implies for low energy theories. That what, is there any signal of low energy,、uh, uh, quantum gravity that we can observe in low energy? And one of the very interesting、uh, general statements. It seems to be applicable for a broad class of quantum gravity theory is that、uh, the quantum gravity should not have exact global symmetry, that any symmetry that you see in low energy has to be either broken by higher derivative terms in a correction to a low energy effective theory Lagrangian, or、uh, they have to be gauge symmetry in disguise. So, here is a standard imprecise argument、uh, of why you cannot have global symmetry. So, suppose uh, 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 you have a, a quantum gravity theory with global symmetry. And、uh, so then、uh, you can have a, a state with、uh, transforming under various r e p r e s e n t a t i o n of the group. And、uh, so, particle can, should also, there must be also some particle which are charged with respect to this group. So, then you can combine them together to make black hole with arbitrary large representation of groups. So, there, uh, for now, uh, let me assume that uh, this group is, uh, is a, a Lie group. So, you can have、uh, a, re a unitary representation of arbitrary large dimensions. So, so like SU2, uh, 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 E8, or whatever, that you can have arbitrary large dimensions of unitary irreducible representations. And suppose you have such black hole state, and suppose it's Hawking radiate. Well, if it is global symmetry,、uh, we expect that Hawking radiation to be neutral under the global symmetry. So it's called G blind. So, so that means that the, the representation should be preserved. So, what happens eventually is that the black hole becomes smaller. So that means that the that entropy of the black hole becomes smaller, the number of representation. So, so, sorry. The number of microstates becomes smaller and smaller because it's proportional to the area of the horizon. So, eventually, you can have a situation where dimensional representation is bigger than the、uh, number of states accommodated by microstate, and that would be、uh, a contradiction.、Uh, of course, you have to arrange it so that、uh, the initial representation is large enough. 
So that even if the uh, black hole uh, a microstate becomes, the number of microstates becomes smaller than the representation, black hole is still large enough so that uh, Hawking's argument still applies. So this is a standard argument that, that people think that uh, you cannot have global symmetry in quantum gravity. But there are loopholes. Well, is this true that Hawking radiation is exactly uh, charge neutral? And also this argument does not apply to discrete uh, global symmetry. If you have say, for example, finite group, then uh, you only have finite number of representations. So this the argument does not work. And so we would like to have a more precise argument and arguments that apply both to uh, finite group and uh, uh, continuous groups. So this is what I would like to present in the first half of my talk. Okay, so sorry. to do that, uh, okay, I need sorry, to sorry, sort of sorry, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, can you explain a little bit so what you mean by exact, exact global symmetry? Exact global symmetry means the following. So, so this is a quantum theory. So you have a Hilbert space and you have a Hamiltonian. And, uh, uh, oh yeah, by the way, I will give you a more precise definition of this later in a specific circumstance. But uh, uh, at this level, what I mean is that you have a unitary operator acting non-trivially on the Hilbert space and uh, it commute with Hamiltonian in such a way that these operators act non-trivially on local operator uh, in the theory. But I will give you a more precise uh, definition later. Okay, okay thank you. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. Uh, may I ask you uh, this question? I, I don't understand. If um, it, it radiates, um, then the, the components are uh, not uh, diminishing. They are just going uh, away from the, uh, the black hole. So the representation still keeps uh, the same number of constituents, so to say. Why, why should it... Uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, would you expect that uh, the representation becomes smaller? So, so here is an argument. So uh, suppose a black hole is in a particular representation. Suppose you have such a situation. Suppose a black hole is in a particular representation. So Hawking radiation is, a, we expect Hawking radiation to be a unitary time evolution process. And mm -hmm. then Hawking radiation comes out and escape to asymptotic infinity. Okay, so it goes outside of your Hilbert space. And, uh, but these Hawking radiations are neutral. So that means that uh, the black hole stays in the same representation. So black hole stays in the same representation, but you can count now how many states the black hole can possibly have yeah, by counting the entropy of black hole using Hawking's, Bekenstein Hawking's mm -hmm. whole formula. And if that's smaller than the dimension of representation, that seems to be contradiction. That's sort of the argument. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, but I, I'm, I'm okay that you don't totally understand this argument because I would like to give a better argument. Okay, so let me go on. So, so this is a, a brief review of things that you probably know much better than I do, but I just wanted to set up the uh, terminology. So suppose you have a quantum field theory defined on time, time some uh, Cauchy surface. And I would like to define what I mean by this quantum field theory has global symmetry, not quantum gravity, the quantum field theory. So this is something you already know. So suppose you have a global symmetry, what does it mean? It mean, must mean that you must have a unitary operator acting on the Hilbert space, and it has to be a homomorphism. I wanted it to be homomorphism, not necessarily representations, because in my paper, in my paper with Daniel, we consider a situation where this global symmetry is spontaneously broken too. So, so in that case, for technical reason, we wanted this to be homomorphism, but they have some kind of unitary operator. And uh, we assume that it acts uh, on, it preserves the spectrum of operator localized in some, some region, any region in this Cauchy surface. And this operator faithfully represents the group in this space of unit, uh, local operators and commute with the energy momentum tensor. So, so this is the definition of what we mean by global symmetry. And this is to be contrasted with uh, gauge symmetry. In the case of gauge symmetry, uh, for example, you don't have non-trivial operator acting non-trivially on uh, a physical Hilbert space. 
So very important concept is uh, splitability of this symmetry. And since Roberto is here, so I'm uh, quite hesitant to talk about this aspect, but I will try my best. So, so this is my understanding is the generalization of the Neta theorem. So suppose the G is a, a Lie group, a continuous and differentiable group. And so then Neta theorem says that you have to have Neta coming. So unitary, in that case, you, this unitary operator that I introduced here can be written as exponential of integral of Neta charge, okay? So suppose, uh, for example, the Cauchy surface is divided into a uh, sub uh, sort of disjoint union of uh, subsectors, subspaces. Then by construction, it's clear that this unitary operator can be expressed as product of unitary operator acting on each of these disjoint uh, uh, regions, okay? So, so this is what is called the uh, uh, splitability of symmetry. So the question is, uh, that does it hold for any symmetry? So this, this is true for this class of symmetry. But for example, is this true even for discrete symmetry? So uh, uh, Roberto and his collaborator show that uh, this is a case under some technical assumption about quantum field theory, which seems to be quite uh, general. And it's called the split property. So let me just spend a couple of slides discussing that. So they define that the quantum field theory on uh, uh, some Cauchy surface times time direction is, has split property if the following is true, that if you have this kind of overlapping uh, region on this Cauchy surface, then there must always be a, a type one factor N between this algebra broker operator in this smaller space and the larger space. You have, if, you, if you have some region and if you op make the region slightly larger, then there is always type one for Neumann factor. And the important thing is that this factor has trivial center. And it essentially means that uh, if you thicken this region, then the Hilbert space split. That uh, you can split the Hilbert space to essentially the Hilbert space and its complement. Of course, this is not true that uh, the, in the strict sense. And it's reflected on the fact that this algebra of uh, 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 these local operators is not type one factor. But uh, this property means that if you thicken this region a little bit, then, then you, can, you can have type one factor in. Okay, so this is a split property. And then they prove this uh, split property of symmetry assuming this property. It's useful to know that sometimes it fails. So, so here is a counter example to split property. Here is an example of quantum field theory where split property is not true. So suppose you consider pure Maxwell theory. It's a Maxwell theory, the electromagnet, uh, electro, the, it's, a, it's a theory of uh, uh, U1 gauge theory, field without any charged matter. And suppose you consider this Cauchy surface to be S1 times some compact D minus two dimension. The total space time is D dimension. You have one time D minus one dimensional Cauchy surface. Suppose you have this kind of structure. So in this case, it's a pure Maxwell theory. So electric flux, is conserved. So consider electric flux uh, penetrating this compact space. So then since there are no charged particles, so it commute with any local operator in this local region. So suppose I choose this region to be like that, S1 times segment. So sorry, she, uh, this compact space times segment on this S1 direction. Then if you choose this, then what happens is that uh, uh, this electric flux commute with any of the operator uh, in this space of local, uh, uh, local operators, uh, algebra local operator. So that means that uh, you, uh, this electric flux has to belong to the center of this algebra, if there is such a form, type one for Neumann algebra. And that's a contradiction because the phi is actually non-trivial operator. If you consider Wilson line going around this S1, then it acts commute non-trivially with this phi. Okay, so, so, so here is a, Counter example to this uh, split property. And it, you, you can trace the uh, 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 origin of the problem to the existence of what is called one form symmetry, some generalized notion of symmetry. Uh, and that's why uh, Wilson lines charged with respect to this, this thing. And uh, you also, uh, this, is, this is a case for pure Maxwell theory, but uh, if you have charged operator, 
then, then this problem goes away. So this is actually related to the completeness hypothesis that I'm going to talk about later. But for us, uh, so uh, it is okay because uh, it seems to me, that, so this is the uh, intuition that uh, algebraic quantum field theorists have and I don't, but it is generally believed that uh, uh, for Euclidean space, the split property is true. For example, this counter example exists because this Cauchy surface has, has non-trivial topology. And we are interested generally in conformal field theory in Euclidean space or sphere, and the sphere is conformal to this. So uh, uh, we would expect that conformal field theory on this is also uh, expect to split because of the space state operator for correspondence. So for our purpose, uh, this counter example doesn't concern me because uh, uh, we are interested in much simpler situation. So from now on, I proceed assuming that split property is true so that uh, uh, global symmetry charges always split, okay? Uh, now I have to define what uh, I mean by uh, global symmetry in quantum gravity. And this is uh, to respond to uh, Xiao Zhang's uh, question. So I would like to give you a little bit more precise definition of what we mean by quantum gravity, okay? So of course we don't have a definition of quantum gravity independently. So I'm going to use ADS CFT correspondence uh, to, to understand uh, quantum gravity in ADS. And uh, we don't have independent definition of quantum gravity in ADS. We define it through CFT. So what I need to do is to come up with a reasonable set of assumptions, uh, expectation about gravity theory in Einstein space and try to formulate it in the language of conformal pieces. Okay? So first thing I would like to do, uh, show a uh, claim is to say that if you have global symmetry in quantum gravity and theta space, then there must be a corresponding global symmetry in its conformal field theory dual. Okay, so, so reasonable expectation is that if you have a, a, a quantum, a quantum gravity in and theta space, and if such theory have global symmetry, then it should reduce to ordinary uh, global symmetry quantum, gravity, uh, quantum field theory in the limit when you turn off the Newton's coupling. And in that case, it should act on local operators. Uh, in general, in quantum gravity, you can also have uh, some extended objects which are charged, like you can have black hole with charges. But in the prescription of ADS CFT correspondence, even if you have some quasi extended object like black hole in the ADS, if you look at the cor for corresponding uh, op object in conformal field theory, it always goes back to local operator. There is all, so any sort of, uh, states in quantum gravity theory with finite energy, whether it is a local particle, locally excited particle or some uh, black hole state, there is always a corresponding uh, uh, local operator in conformal fields by what we call state operator correspondence. Okay. So, so, so that brings us to the following set of expectation for global symmetry in antiwater space. First of all, if you have a global symmetry in quantum gravity in interstellar space, there must be a corresponding global symmetry in the dual conformal theory. And uh, uh, it should act locally on quasi-local bulk operators, including black holes. And uh, so strictly speaking, in quantum gravity, you cannot have precise local operator because uh, uh, the coordinate is not a diffeomorphic invariant concept, but you have a procedure called gravitational dressing, which makes a quasi local operator to be uh, uh, observable in a gravitational theory. So we assume that is the case. And we, we want that symmetry to be represented phase three, realized phase three on the space of these local operators. Otherwise, I mean, we can just come up with arbitrary symmetry and claim that uh, uh, it is a symmetry of the uh, 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 theory by having that uh, symmetry acting trivially on the Hilbert space, right? So you, in order to claim that it is a symmetry, there has to be something that that symmetry is acting non-trivial. So we expect that uh, uh, it has to be phase-free represented. And uh, uh, it has to commute with conformal symmetry on the boundary. So, uh, so these are sort of set of assumptions that we make. And we would like to 
So this was, a, this was the hardest part of my project with uh, Daniel, because we wanted to define what we mean by uh, global symmetry in quantum gravity. And this is a reasonable uh, uh, set of property. But eventually, we want to prove that such a thing does not exist. So somehow, our task was complicated because we needed to define things that we're going to eventually prove that, that, that does not exist. So, so we want to prove that such a thing does not exist. OK? So in order to prove that, we use what is called entanglement with reconstruction. So this is sort of a refinement of the dictionary of ADS-CFT correspondence. So ADS-CFT correspondence says that essentially anything that is happening in the antiwitter space, in the gravitational theory in antiwitter space, can be encoded in the Hilbert space on the conformal field theory on the boundary. Okay? So, so, so there is a correspondence between Hilbert space of antiwitter space, a gravity, and Hilbert space of a conformal field theory on the boundary. So that's a sort of ADS-CFT correspondence. But uh, entanglement wedge reconstruction is a more refined statement, which is a following, that uh, uh, there is a notion called Ryu Takayanagi surface. So suppose uh, we have, so this is a caricature of a space-like slice, Cauchy slice of antidata space. Cauchy slice of antidata space is a hyperbolic space. And so, so this, is, this circle is meant to be hyperbolic disk with boundary being the, uh, uh, the boundary of this hyperbolic space. So I'm using this disk model of hyperbolic space. And this is meant to be higher dimension, okay? And uh, so the boundary is a sphere, okay? So, uh, so suppose uh, you have some event happening inside. So suppose you put some local operator over in the, in the middle, then it must be encoded on the boundary conformal phase. So, uh, but suppose you divide the boundary sphere into two parts, this part C plus B, and this part A. Okay, so there is a thing called the Ryu Takayanagi surface, which is a minimum surface inside of the antiwitter space, uh, defined by the antiwitter space metric, uh, which is subtended on the boundary of this region. So, so if you have region A, there is a uh, Ryu Takayanagi surface, which is the same as the Ryu Takayanagi surface of the complement. So entanglement wedge reconstruction said that uh, uh, everything that is happening, this shaded region between Ryu Takayanagi surface and this boundary region can be encoded in the part of the Hilbert space associated to this region. Okay. In order to make this statement more precise, we have to use this language of this for Neumann algebra and split properties, et cetera. But roughly speaking, uh, suppose you can split the Hilbert space into roughly associated to this segment A and C union B, then event happening here is encoded in this region, okay? So this is called entanglement wedge reconstruction. And uh, this has been substantiated by uh, a variety of ideas. And uh, 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 about five years ago or so, uh, Daniel Haro and the collaborator realized that this idea of entanglement with reconstruction is closely related to the notion of quantum error correction in a quantum information theory. So here is actually, this is meant to be the uh, picture which shows the relation between entanglement with reconstruction and uh, uh, quantum error corrections. So, so suppose you have this event happening uh, uh, inside of this antiwitter space, and these three are meant to be the same event. So if you consider this, if you divide the boundary into three segments, if you consider B union C, then uh, this event is inside of the shaded region associated to B and C. So it's called, we, can, we can say it's an in, in the entanglement wedge of B union C. So that means that you can encode this information into B union C. But you can also encode this information into A union B, or you can encode this information into A union C. The same information can be encoded in these three different Hilbert spaces. And surprising thing is that even though, for example, uh, information about this can be encoded in A union B, but if you consider just Hilbert space associated A alone, this cannot know about the information, know, know the information about this event because it's outside of this entanglement wedge. Similarly, the region B alone cannot know about this event because it's outside of this entanglement wedge. 
only when you combine these two Hilbert spaces, you, you can recover information about this. So that means that the information about this event is encoded in the entanglement in the Hilbert space associated to A and B. And this, this mechanism is very similar to that of quantum uh, uh, error corrections. And uh, so that was sort of pointed out by Daniel Haro. And I, we are going to use the, uh, this idea in an essential way in a proof of absence of global symmetry. So with this preparation, I, we are ready to, I'm ready to present my argument in one slide. Uh, but before we, I go there, uh, if there is any question, probably I should take now. Uh, 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 I have a question. Uh, so, yes, uh, so for some effective uh, potential at low energy, uh, people may have um, uh, approximate symmetry at uh, a large field limit in the modular space. So uh, is this uh, approximate global symmetry also uh, of your concern? No. So, so I think that, as I said at the very beginning, uh, I'm going to prove that there is no exact global symmetry. So from that, one can, one can expect that any accidental symmetry that can be seen, that you might see in low energy theory has to be either violated in the way that you described, which is that it's an approximate symmetry and it's violated by, if you consider uh, a high energy uh, effect, or it is a gauge symmetry in this case. So our results specifically do not include the kind of situation you have. And that we expect, in fact, that, that can be one of the outcomes. Okay, so, okay. so, uh, so the inflationary potential with uh, approximate shift symmetry is still allowed it in quantum right. gravity, so, right? So, well, then it gets to a, quantify, a quantitative question. So namely that, so, 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 so our result applied to spontaneously broken symmetry case prohibit exactly flat potential which goes to infinity. So that means that the, the potential has to be have you cannot have flat potential it has to be lifted or in, in, at some point. But our result does not tell you quantitatively how how big the region can be. Okay, so that that that's one of the things that we would like to do, but. We don't give you quantitative prediction. So, so then whether within that scale, whether inflation is allowed or not is a different question. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right. So let me proceed. Unless there is any further question, uh, let me proceed to present our claim, our, 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 our outline of our theory, okay? Outline of proof of our theory. Uh, so here is this. So suppose you have a gravitational theory in i Twitter space that has global symmetry. Is exact global symmetry. That means that there must be quasi local bulk operators. There must be an operator in the bulk that transforms phase free under such a symmetry. So, suppose I place such an operator at x in the middle of antiliter space. This is meant to be a spatial slice of antiliter space. And so, the, the, there must be some symmetry operator on the boundary conformal theory because global symmetry in antiliter space is a global symmetry of the conformal theory. And uh, suppose you divide the boundary into segment. So then by the split property, this unitary operator split into operator acting non-trivially only on each of the segment. So for example, U of G R1 acts only on this segment. But the problem is that the uh, entanglement weight of this, each of these segments are represented in these shaded regions and none of that touches X. So that means that this symmetry operator has to commute with quasi local operator, which is in contradiction with the assumption I made in the first sentence. So this is essentially the proof. Okay. So, so uh, Daniel Haro and I wrote two papers on this subject. One is a short five page summary, which appears in physical review letters. And then 35 times longer paper, which recently appears in GMP. And the reason for that is that uh, this five page summary basically describes something like that. And then in this 175 page paper, we gave you more precise definition of symmetries and uh, et cetera. So substantial part of this paper is devoted in defining what we mean by all these quasi local operators, symmetries, et cetera. Okay, so bas but basically this is the idea. So I pointed out earlier that uh, the concept of entanglement with reconstruction is closely related to 
uh, uh, quantum error correction. So uh, in fact, uh, uh, after we uh, put out a paper, uh, we learned that there is actually closely related theorem in quantum error correction called the Eastern Canal theorem, which says the following. So suppose you have uh, this kind of quantum error uh, 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 correcting code. The suppose you have this logical information you want to encode into a set of physical of, uh, physical gate, uh, physical uh, 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 site, uh, site. And so there is this kind of uh, 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 map between them. So then, uh, so you want to encode this logical qubit into physical qubit. And then the theorem said that uh, uh, there is no non-trivial unitary uh, operator acting on this logical uh, qubit that can be expressed as product of a unitary operator on the physical qubit, where each, each UI uh, preserves uh, code subspaces. So this is very closely related to this idea of a proof. We just, we learned that after we published the paper, but this is not surprising given the close connection between the uh, uh, ADS-CFT and quantum error corrections. I have a few comments. Uh, so uh, Xiao Jiang asked about uh, uh, inflaton potential, and this is related to the question of spontaneously gro broken global symmetry. This argument actually applies to a spontaneously broken global symmetry. And in fact, it was why we actually, when we defined global symmetry in quantum theory, we defined this unitary operator as homomorphism rather than representation of the group. Because the reason was that uh, if you do that, then it's applied to a spontaneously broken global symmetry. So for example, suppose you have some scalar field in low energy effective theory with shift symmetry, then this shift symmetry must be broken at some point. And uh, so that is a consequence of the theorem. It's also applied to discrete space time symmetry such as parity and time reversal symmetry. So in fact, uh, if you have a general low energy effective theory, you have a choice. You can, you can, uh, you can decide whether parity is a global symmetry or gauge symmetry. Okay. In a gravitational theory, for example, parity may be regarded as a non-normalizable part of uh, uh, diffeomorphism, in which case it is a global uh, gauge symmetry. But uh, you can also independently think of this as global symmetry. Our theorem says that you, don't, you cannot have choice in quantum gravity, that this has to be gauge symmetry. But it will have, if you do that, if you, it will have a consequence. Because if it is a global symmetry, then when you quantize gravity and sum over geometry, you have a choice of not summing over non-orientable manifold. But uh, if you, uh, uh, parity and time reversal symmetry is a gauge symmetry, you are obliged to sum over non-orientable manifold in summing over topology of Euclidean quantum gravity. So it has a consequence uh, 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 like that. Uh, I would also like to point out that our argument assumes quantum uh, 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 entanglement with reconstruction. And there are some quantum gravity theory in low dimensions where this does not hold. So for example, two-dimensional quantum gravity, some of them don't have holographic description, so therefore don't have uh, uh, entanglement with reconstruction. And so there are counter examples. For example, on string wall sheet, in string theory, you have two-dimensional world sheet. And on this world sheet, you can think of two-dimensional theory as having quantum gravity on the surface, because string world sheet is a two-dimensional conformal field theory coupled to two-dimensional gravity. And this theory can have global symmetry. So for example, if you consider heterotic string, the world sheet theory can have E8 plus E8 global symmetry, for example, or SO32 over Z2. So there are counter examples to that effect. Uh, also, if you consider three-dimensional Einstein gravity, then it can have uh, parity as uh, uh, discrete symmetry rather than uh, gauge symmetry. Although there is some, still some debate on whether three-dimensional pure gravity exists or not, but that's a separate question. Okay, so this is the, uh, this, is, this was sort of the main thing I wanted to tell you. And then I would like to give you a few other statements we can derive from for quantum gravity. But before we go there, uh, is there any, any question so far? So I think this is the most important slide in my talk. So it's, especially if you have a question on this, I'd be happy to take. 
If not, uh, let me move on to other statements we can prove. So another one of the other statements I wanted to tell you is the completeness of gauge representations. So I told you that uh, quantum gravity theory in IDS cannot have global symmetry, but it can have gauge symmetry. Okay, so suppose you have gauge symmetry G. So now we change the gear. Now we assume G is a gauge symmetry. So if you have a gauge symmetry, then if you put charge on it, it's not gauge invariant. But you can make this gauge invariant by adding Wilson line attached to it. We, so we can have Wilson line with N on X, and then you can have non-trivial representation over here. So you can have a charged operator with Wilson line emanating from it. But it has to end somewhere on the boundary. So then it does not contradict with, it, this argument does not apply for gauge symmetry because uh, uh, the, the unitary operator acting on this segment, say R3, can act non-trivially on the end point of the Wilson line. So there is no contradiction. So gauge symmetry is possible. So first thing to ask is that if you have gauge symmetry, you have a global symmetry on the boundary. And so is this the same group that, uh, uh, suppose you have uh, gauge symmetry G in the quantum gravity theory. The, does the conformal field theory on the boundary have the same G? So in order to claim that these are the same G, we need to show that this unitary operator acts faithfully on the bulk operator. So we need to show that for any element of the group, there is a non-trivial operator in the bulk that uh, uh, transforms non-trivially under this symmetry. And uh, Daniel and I show that you can construct such operator if you consider wormhole in isolated space. So if you have a black hole, Schwarzschild solution in isolated space, which you can construct, then there is a wormhole pen go, uh, pen uh, uh, connect to asymptotic isolated space region through Einstein roads and bridge. And so in that case, you have two asymptotic isolated space. So you have pair of conformal field theory, which are entangled in a sense of some of double, double state. And then you can have Wilson line penetrating through it. So then for any representation, you can consider such Wilson line. So you can have Wilson line with end point on these two Hilbert spaces. And such Wilson line can act, uh, have non-trivial commutation relation with any of the uh, element of the group. So, so here is an outline of this description. So if you have a Wilson line operator penetrating through Einstein Rosen bridge, then, then, then you can show that uh, if you consider a, a unitary operator acting one of the Hilbert space, it transforms just like in that representation. Since you can choose any representation, so that means that uh, uh, this unitary operator must be represented faithfully on this Hilbert space. So that's what we wanted to show. So this actually uh, uh, leads to what's called the completeness hypothesis. A completeness hypothesis is the following statement. So if you have a quantum theory of gravity, then, uh, and then, then if you have a gauge group G, then in the space of local operator, uh, you must have all the represent unitary representation of the group realized. Okay, so this is, this is, not, this is not obvious. And in fact, it's not true for general quantum field theory. You can come up with a quantum field theory for which some of the representations are missing in the Hilbert space. Easiest example is a pure Maxwell theory where none of the representation appears in the Hilbert space. And, uh, but in, the claim is that if you have quantum theory of gravity, then all the possible unitary finite dimensional reducible representation should appear uh, 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 as a local operator. And we can prove this because we just proved that at least there is one finite dimensional faithful representation rule. So if you have one, then you can consider operator product representation and you can actually prove this is a simple uh, 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 group theory fact that you can have generate all finite dimensional unitary representation of G by considering this kind of tensor product and then decompose that. So this proves a, a completeness hypothesis. The important thing was to show that uh, you can have faithful unitary representation of the group in, by the local operator. Okay, so this is a proof of completeness hypothesis. This was hypothesized by Joe Porczynski, and we gave a proof of that in the case of quantum gravity and intuitive space. 
So more recently, uh, Daniel Haro and I gave uh, more sort of quantitative uh, 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 observation about uh, completeness in the following sense. That we found the following part. That suppose you have a conformal field theory which has holographic de description in terms of gravitational theory in Einstein space. And uh, so far, we, we only gave an argument when symmetry is finite group. So I give it an argument for finite group. Suppose you have a, a sim, a gauge symmetry in a global symmetry in CFT, which is a finite group. Okay. So that means that in the bulk Einstein space, you have finite group gauge symmetry. So, so if you have that, then we can consider the following object. So you have a Hilbert space of conformal field theory. So you can consider partition function of this conformal field theory. H is a Hamiltonian beta is inverse temperature. But instead of considering the plane, plane partition function, we consider what is called the tw twined partition function, twisted partition function. Namely, we insert a unitary operator associated with, with G as an element of the group. And take trace over the Hilbert space. The observation that Daniel Haro and I made is the following. So suppose you consider this uh, twisted partition function and take the temperature to be very, very large. So then we, we found that uh, this partition function has this universal property that, uh, that it, this, uh, this is localized on the uh, identity operator. This is a finite group, so this is a Kronecker derivative. Okay, so this is, a, this, is, this is an observation. And I would like to explain how we came up with the observation, okay? But uh, this observation has an interesting consequence. So this is what I teach in, for undergraduate groups in the undergraduate group theory course, that uh, because of the complete, com uh, characters of unitary irreducible representation, it gives you a complete basis of class, fun class function of the group. So that means that uh, this delta function of the group can be expanded in terms of sum of the characters with the weight given by dimension of the representation. Okay, so that means that because this is a delta function, so each each so this representation has dimension alpha. So that means that if you choose high energy state, very high energy state of this conformal history, and if you pick them randomly, then the chance that it is in the representation alpha is given by this quantity dimension alpha square divided by the number of elements in the group. Okay, and this is, this is reasonable as a probability because uh, it's a simple identity that if you sum over alpha, it gives you one. Okay, so, so, so this, is, this, is a, this is a simplest thing that you can think of for uh, if you have random distribution of state, then, then, then the each representation occupies uh, this, this much of the Hilbert space. Okay, this is a consequence of that. And then, then we observe that if you have a holographic conformal field theory, namely conformal field theory dual to gravitational theory in the space, then this is something you can derive. Okay, so let me give you a derivation of this. Okay, so in order to do that, uh, uh, I, I need to give, I need to uh, first uh, give you some uh, uh, general statement. So if you have uh, 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 a conformal field theory, which has anti-theta space gravity dual, then any state in the conformal field theory has corresponding state in anti-theta space. So you have a vacuum in conformal field theory. So you have a vacuum in anti-theta space, which is basically the situation where nothing is happening. There are no particles. And then there are some low energy state in conformal field theory, which you, for example, you can act some local operator on the Hilbert space. That correspond to having a gravity, a gravitational theory where some few particles are propagating in isolated space. But then if you go to high energy state, at some moment, you get to the situation where generic state in generic high energy state in conformal field theory all correspond to black hole in isolated space. So we expect that uh, all the high energy state in conformal field theory correspond to black hole. And uh, that's quantitatively uh, correct in the sense that, uh, you, for example, in 2D CFT, you can es estimate the asymptotic density of a state of conformal field theory using Cardi's formula. And that agrees with uh, a number of states that you can expect for a uh, 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 black hole by using Bekenstein Hawking's formula. So in isolated space, Bekenstein Hawking formula and Cardi formula agrees for 2D CFT case. 
And there is a general argument that uh, this is the case in higher dimension. So that means that if you calculate this kind of quantity, then you can calculate in the bulk side using black hole geometry. But this is a Euclidean conformal field theory calculation. So gravitational theory should also be. OK, so Sebastiano have a question. Please unmute yourself. Yes, sorry. OK, so now the question is just uh, on the assumption, probably. So I would like to understand, yeah, uh, your, uh, so this unitary group, no, UG. Oh, this is a finite it, group. It looks strange in a sense for. It's a finite group. It's not a unitary group. It's ah, a finite okay. group. It is a finite group. Realized unitarily on the Hilbert. But there is no, so uh, the question is there is some assumption there is a vacuum or vectors of zero energy or or not. So, yes. So, so, so I called it, I, 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 we, we claim this statement for holographic conformal field theory, okay. and I so, haven't defined it. So, this is a conformal field theory which has. Which, are, yes. according to ADS of the correspondence, have a dual, which is uh, gravitational theory and okay. space. So, so the, it has to have a vari variety of properties, such as it's a it's Hebrew space unitary. You have to have a Hamiltonian, which is bounded below, and you have to have a ground state, have a ground and uh, etc. Okay, no, uh, but the ground state is invariant under the action of of the group or not? Uh, we don't have to assume it, but uh, okay. I think it's a consequence of a large class of the But it must be a finite, so this is... Uh... It's a, but our argument that you applies to finite group, although I have reason to suspect that this is true for larger class of groups. Mm. Okay. But we can only derive this for finite group. That's why I'm limiting to finite group. But in fact, as I will show you, that uh, it is known that this applies to larger class of groups. Okay. Yeah, okay. I will tell you more about that later. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so here is an argument. So, so, so in the bulk side, we gonna we can use black hole Euclidean black hole geometry uh, use, uh, to evaluate this. And one thing about black hole is that you have a horizon. When you have a horizon. And if you uh, uh, analytically continue in time direction to make Euclidean black hole, the horizon means that the boundary circle can shrink to a point because horizon is, is basically null surface. So if you analytically continue to Euclidean geometry, then null surface shrinks to a point. So, so basically what happened, the, the, this is a black hole in caricature. So you have a boundary in Euclidean time. So this is a Euclidean time circle. And the Euclidean time circle can shrink, is become contractible if you have black hole. So therefore, this type of calculation can be described in terms of uh, a boundary time uh, Euclidean time circle, which is contractible. But we are inserting this twist by this group element. So we are inserting this unitary operator on the edge on this. Uh, so at, some, at one point on this Euclidean time, you have insertion of this group element. So this is sort of caricature of this. And we want to show that this is non zero only when G is trivial. Okay, so, so here's an argument. So suppose we, you can consider Wilson line in any representation which starts and ends on the boundary. Okay, and suppose these two endpoints are very close to each other, then this is uh, the I and J is an in index. I and J's are indices of state in the representation alpha. So when I and J are very close to each other, Wilson line become trivial. So it must become identity. Okay, so this blue line, the Wilson line, with endpoint being element of this representation. When they are close to each other, uh, it becomes identity. But since this is a finite group, so there is no local holonomy that you can move Wilson line freely without any consequence. So we can move this endpoint to the other side of this unitary operator by moving this endpoint through this side. But then when you jump to this endpoint I over this unitary operator, well, it generates a matrix for the representation alpha. So that means, and then you can move this away, and then you can use Kronecker delta to write it in this way. So using this argument in the bulk, we were able to derive this equality that uh, Kronecker delta minus this representation matrix for any group element G multiplied to this, uh, this thing has to be equal to zero for any representation. 
So let me pause a moment to let you think what's the consequence of this identity. So, so you have this uh, Kronecker delta minus any representation matrix for any group element for any alpha multiplied to this twisted partition function is equal to zero. What does this identity mean for, for, for this twisted uh, representation? Well, what this means is that uh, the, the G has to be trivial because if G is trivial, this is true. But uh, if you, if you, if you demand that this is true for any representation, the only possibility is that G is true. You can actually derive that using Peter Weil theorem, for example. So, so this is the consequence. So for high energy limit where a black hole dominates in the bulk, then this has to be the case. So, so you see that this is a very simple argument. And this does not make use of any detailed dynamics of gravitational theory. We don't use Einstein gravity. We, just assume the fact that high energy states are dominated by black hole and the black hole has contractible time cycle. That's all we use. So it seems like uh, it's reasonable to expect that uh, this holds for larger class of quantum field theory, not a necessary holographic conformal field theory. In fact, while we were writing this paper, we realized that uh, this is actually true for any unitary conformal field theory in two dimensions. Even for unitary, uh, for even for continuous B group symmetry. So we had some footnote about it. And after we published a paper, uh, we learned that actually last year, uh, Sridip Pal and Sun had a paper where actually they actually give a proof of this statement. So, so basically, this makes use of paraphernalia representation. Of In the case of continuous group, you use, we use paraphernalia representation. And, but it seemed like uh, this is a rather general statement. And we also, another comment we made was that uh, uh, this seems to be the consequence of the completeness of gauge charges, because uh, uh, the kind of argument we gave for, to derive the completeness, that uh, you, you have some faithful unitary representation, and you can have tensor product to generate all other representations. If you make this a little bit com uh, quantitative, then you can actually derive this numerical factor too. So, so then uh, more recently, uh, there are actually a couple of papers uh, appeared where uh, they gave some further evidence that uh, this property is true for larger class of quantum field theory and also uh, uh, even for continuous groups. So there is this paper by Javier Megan, uh, which actually makes use of earlier work by Cassini, Huerta, Megan, and Pontello, uh, where uh, he derived this uh, property for any, uh, I think, my understanding is that any symmetry in a large class of quantum field theory, assuming certain property of some field double state. And uh, this paper makes heavy use of idea from algebraic quantum field theories. And I, I cannot claim that I have understood all technical aspects of the derivation. So I think this audience may be better suit, suited to decipher this paper. But uh, it seems to me that this is actually the kind of things that algebraic quantum field theorists can try to make uh, more precise and maybe uh, put it in a rigorous footing and specify exactly what class of theory for which this is applicable. Uh, there is also a very interesting paper by Kao Meria Paul. Paul. This Paul is the same Paul as this Paul. And, but Kao and Meria are actually member of Cabri IPMU, where as actually they proved first for free field theory. Okay, so you can, if you may think that well, free field theory is very simple and trivial. But in fact, uh, even proving this statement for free, free field theory is a very interesting combinatorial uh, work. And then they went on to actually uh, uh, show that this is also true, even if you include coupling cons uh, interactions in a weakly coupled way. And in fact, uh, just coincidentally, uh, Tom Meria is going to actually give a talk uh, today uh, in Japan time, uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, today for most of us, I think. <laughs> uh, at, uh, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's uh, 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 noon in Japan time. So even Kawahigashi-san can attend it. Uh, and uh, so if you are interested, I would recommend that. Uh, so I think that more is all I wanted to say. So this is 50, uh, uh, four minutes before the end. So let me end with a couple of 
uh, things that I'm interested in understanding in the future. And this is again uh, related to one of the questions that was being asked to make this claim more quantitative. So I explained that uh, uh, any global symmetry in low energy effective theory of quantum gravity must be approximate in the sense that it's either violated in high energy or uh, gauge symmetry in disguise. But then you can ask, well, how it is broken? And for example, is this broken by higher derivative term suppressed by Planck mass, for example? So I think this kind of quantitative statement is very interesting. So for example, University of Tokyo is building hyper Kamiokande, which is supposed to be like five times bigger than super Kamiokande. And one of the stated purposes is to detect the proton decay or test the proton decay idea. And the proton decay is predicted by my theory because uh, uh, proton is protected by uh, uh, B minus L symmetry of standard model of particle physics, which is a global symmetry. And it has to be violated or there must be gauge, gauge charge associated. In either case, proton must decay. Unfortunately, I cannot predict how big that effect is from my theorem. So I cannot advise the University of Tokyo whether building 10 times, uh, five times bigger water tank is enough to detect the proton decay. So I would like to do that and that requires making this more quantitative. And uh, so I also proved the uh, completeness hypothesis, which means that uh, there must be some kind of local state, which is uh, in the, any representation of symmetry. But for example, it would be nice to give it some kind of upper bound for the energy or the mass of the state with, with, any, uh, with given representation. And so that's another quantity. And another obvious thing we would like to do is to uh, go beyond ADSGFT correspondence, like flat space, or digital space, is there some analog of this state? So, so that's all I wanted to say. Oh, thank you uh, for your attention. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, do you have any question or comment? May I ask a question? Uh, Please. Yeah. Uh, so I have, in fact, two questions. One, you mentioned that your result uh, now it's uh, some generalization to, to more general groups, but I don't understand why your argument does not work for arbitrary compact group. So well, you, which, which one are you talking about in my last? The last thing? one, when you, the, the, the one that vanish, the vanish, uh, vanishing of this, uh, of this um, uh, your, your formula that you have in, in page 18, let's say. This one. Yes, one. Here, yeah, this, ar this argument, uh, I don't see why it does not work for arbitrary compact groups. Okay. Uh, yeah, so if you have an argument, I'd like to know. No, no, I, I mean the, exactly the same argument. What, well, what? so the, the, the argument I gave here does not work because here the argument relies on the fact that I can move the wheel. Ah, okay, so, so only at this point. So you get some holonomy. Uh, yeah, if, yes, if yes, yes, yes. So, so it's a diff in general, these two are different. And you, you have no control how they are different. In, in well, the so I think that one, so one physical hand waving argument I have is that if you go to high energy, so basically the difference between the holonomy is controlled by, in the case of compact unitary group, for example, the com compact regroup, for example, mm -hmm. then the, 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 amount, the difference is related to the amount of field strength mm -hmm. you have over here, right? Because it, uh, the, the curvature of gauge band is controlling this. Mm -hmm. So we want to show if we can say that that contribution is suppressed for high energy state or high temperature state, then you can derive this. For finite group, we, we get it for free because there is no local field strength for finite group. I understand, that's nice. I have another question, if possible. Yes, please. This, this question is, uh, goes to the uh, beginning of your talk, where you have uh, this counterexample to the split property. Ah, uh, yes, yes. So if I understand, uh, your counterexample is made by showing that uh, the center of this intermediate algebra would have a center. Yeah, so, so, so I'm but, claiming that this phi is a non-trivial element. Yeah, but uh, I, I wonder whether there exists a type one intermediate subalgebra with some non-trivial center. 
So oh, it, but it is, is that definition of type one saying that uh, it should have a trivial center? Type one factor, but type, if one, factor. Take, type, type one for Neumann algebra is, is, can have a center, no? It's a more general concept. Ah, okay, I, I see. So it, it doesn't have to be factor, you mean? Exactly. So maybe you, ah. you have no, no counter example to the fact that this is a, a non type one. You have a counter ah, example no, no, to no, the I fact that it is a. If but I, is your theorem, does your theorem work? No, no, but uh, one may try to decompose a type one algebra is a direct integral of type one factor. So oh. one may still try to do something that I, at the moment I don't want, but it would be, I, I was wondering when there, that there exists a type one for Neumann algebra. So, yeah, I don't oh, know whether yes, you have I don't thought. have a counter example for that. Okay. No. Yeah, but this is interesting. But do you think that you, your theorem can generalize? I, I this is too much. Uh, I, maybe something can be done, but uh, there is no result for us but for, for the moment because we always consider this uh, intermediate type one factor. But it's already some information that if it also may, maybe if it, if it is needed, one can think of it. Uh, Ah, okay. In, in that's a, that's very interesting. Thank you so much. This is very interesting. So you think that uh, so so I was curious. So you 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 had an intuition that so going back to your first question, you felt that this should generalize easily to this, this uh, slide. In my opinion, I, I I don't catch the point where finite finiteness enter, uh, oh, okay. because this Peter Weil decomposition. All yeah, so these, these are all true for, uh, for any them. any group. Yes. Yeah. So so I understand they they they, they use it only at the, the point uh, you need discreteness to to, to have non trivial to have a trivial holonomy. That what yeah, that's mean. right. But maybe there is something one can do because, in fact, for example, we have an example like two dish conformal you say, where this is true for. Uh, a continuous group too. Yeah, yeah. I, I have also have a question related to this. Yes, please. Um, so, so is this statement on on the top of this slide? Yeah, I, I actually I realized that I forgot to put a trace over. Yeah, there, there's a trace missing. But is, <laughs> can this be reformulated in terms of the um, density of states in in a given representation relative yes yes, to... yes 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 yeah so we can say the same thing so namely what we can say that uh, suppose you have a density of states uh in in the at, at, so, 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 so uh, average the density of state for some high energy state right yeah. so the, generally speaking conformal you said you can have a discrete spectrum so you have to do some kind of average mm -hmm. and suppose you do the averaging then uh, you have some kind of density of state and you can consider decomposing that density of state into irreducible representation. Yes. So this, this theorem basically said that uh, uh, this state appears with this weight. Mm -hmm. So is this at all related to things like this? Uh, how, how in, in two dimensions, is, it, is there a relation between how characters behave for large temperature for different representations is, is that related i mean i'm talking oh, what kind of statement do you have in mind something like the katz wakimoto type uh, statement so the oh yeah so so i think that uh, you can actually show so the that, asymptotic, uh, so asymptotic this, this is a true statement for example in the versus amino with them model yes yes so so in this case so if you look at the asymptotic uh, density of states for you, you know just like in the peter uh, just like in yeah I think, I think it's the same, same statement. Mm -hmm. So so there should be maybe a proof even beyond finite groups, even yeah, for... yeah. So, so this is this is what I mentioned in this uh, in this small print. That yeah. I said that this is true for any unitary CFT in two dimension, whether G is finite or continuous. But even if, if it's not a representation of a group, but something more general, like in, in the minimal models, you know, like, like a, 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 a category like um Oh, so you are considering some more generalized notion of symmetry. Yes. There's a, so like fusion like, category, for example. Yeah, so like a, so if, if you formulate it in terms of density of states, that could be. Um, I, I think it, it is possible that this can be further generalized to fusion categories, for example. 
Yeah. That, that was my question. I mean, if, if yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I just occurred to you. Just pointed that out, and uh, that sounds like a very interesting possibility. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, but I think in 2D CFT, I think something like that has to be true, I think, yeah. Because the argument that uh, apply, uh, one can use for 2D CFT is quite uh, robust, I think. Well, I'm surprised that something like that was not known. Because <laughs> this seems to be rather a simple statement. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other questions or comments? Hello, do you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah, I can hear you very well. Hello. Um, about the first part of your talk, um, is it possible to translate this uh, absence of global symmetry in quantum gravity in terms of purely um, CFT language? Uh... What well, that, that's what basically we did. Uh, that uh, uh, we try to translate the uh, uh, definition of global symmetry in the language of uh, 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 a CFT. And then we prove that such a thing does not exist. How about using quantum gravity argument? Right? Yeah. Uh, so, oh, so what are the additional assumptions to use your CFT you have here? So, so I, I think that, uh, uh, so this is sort of our attempt to uh, formulate what we mean by global symmetry in quantum gravity in the language of conformal concept. Because eventually we want to disprove existence of object in CFT. Mm -hmm. so, so essentially that's what we did in, in our work. Mm. Yeah, but, but for example, a very stupid example, um, uh, the tensor product of two free um, massless CFTs has a flip symmetry, but this must be excluded somehow. So they, th those are not holographic CFT. Uh -huh. Because the uh, tensor product of two CFT has two energy momentum tensor. Mm -hmm. so naively, it seems like you have two gravitons, which is not possible in quantum gravity. Mm -hmm. It is actually, a, a, it's violating Weinberg width and theorem. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Do you have any other uh, comment questions? No, okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much uh, for thank you the very presentation much. and also bye -bye. the discussion. I enjoyed it very uh -huh. much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Uh, bye -bye. Good night. <laughs> thank you very much for having yeah. time, especially for yeah. staying up late. <laughs> yeah, okay. Bye bye. Bye. bye.